Welcome back to Robocar Rally. This is uh, Sunil. And I'm Justin DeCastri. Hey, uh, so sorry guys, I couldn't make it last time. Uh, I was actually in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, so <laughs> sorry about that. But Justin, maybe uh, you can recap what happened last uh, episode. Yeah, so last week what we did is we, we took our autonomous vehicle uh, and mm -hmm. we decided that it made sense to hook it up to the AWS IoT service. Oh. This way we're going to be able to capture telemetry from the vehicle and then save it in the cloud so we can do later processing on what it. What kind of telemetry did you collect? So the, the vehicle as, it's, as it comes, is it, it records the angle and throttle. Okay. Uh, but what I decided to do was add a little bit more data to it, uh, some, somewhat similar to what you'd see in a normal car. So right, right. Um, what I did is I put wheel sensors in each wheel so that I can record the RPMs of each wheel. And now I'm able to discern how far the car has traveled, Right. how fast it's going, right. uh, if there's wheel slip and things like that. So now we, we've enriched our data set to include a number of different things. Oh, so what, what, so besides RPM, are you collecting anything more? Uh, it's RPM, and from that I'm calculating distance and speed. Oh, And that, that's what we get from the, the wheel, the yeah. four wheel sensors. That's super cool. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we should, uh, what, what if the users want to add more sensors? Like, how easy is that? It's pretty simple to do. So the, the most recent distribution of the Donkey project mm -hmm. has introduced a concept called parts. Mm -hmm. So you can add in parts for different sensors and it builds on top of it. And what, what maybe those sensors be like? What would be, uh, what would gel well with this whole concept? So I think what's, what's missing from my car now is um, sensors to detect objects in front of it. Right? Uh -huh. So we've got a camera. Uh, and I've got the, the wheel sensors, but I really... Maybe like ultrasound sensor? I mean, exactly. Uh, okay. You know, LiDAR, there's a number of different technologies right. out there, but something to detect a potential collision or something else. Uh, right. Right now, we're only aware of the lines uh -huh. uh, for, the, for the track is what we have laid out here today. Right. Um, so something, if there's another vehicle in the way or there's something cool. in the road, yeah. Obviously, in a real vehicle, you'd want to have a little bit more intuition. So that's definitely something I think is next right. uh, that we'd want to build. Yeah. And also, like if, if you built your car, uh, you know, uh, send us a holler, um, you know, ha uh, send a tweet out like hashtag road to reinvent. Uh, I mean, we've seen a few cars being built. It's super exciting. Yeah. And, like uh, some of them are super excited to get their car. Uh, on to, uh, yeah, for the rally. I saw one example of somebody did put some ultrasonic sensors right yeah, on the front. I, I, I did too. <laughs> so that was pretty smart. They're already yeah. one step ahead of us. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and that and that's the sort of thing that I think you know the innovation to kind of take this to the next right. level of you know this base project as is, but right. really how do you become more aware of your surroundings and and people tuning in like feel free to uh, you know give us like your wish list of sensors. Uh, what are the cool things you've tried or we should try? Uh, so our aim today is we're going to do a race. So we're going to have two cars race against. So stay, stay tuned. Like mm -hmm. uh, in, in about 30 minutes, uh, we're going to uh, do the race. Uh, and before that, you know, we'll actually dive a little into the concepts that are uh, uh, the deep learning concepts that enable the car to actually drive by itself. Uh, but maybe before that, like mm -hmm. let's, let's, actually do a drive. So I don't know if you guys can see behind, we have a life-size uh, track. Uh, last time we actually did, uh, you know, it was on a little conference room table. So we've kicked it up a notch. We have a, um, a 40 by 20 maybe, like close to that. Yeah. Close to that. Uh, and uh, yeah, why don't we, why don't we self drive, uh, sure. Justin? Um, so we can get that started. I'll put my car down and we'll start driving. Um, go. Sure, we're all plugged in. All right, and we do have uh, two cars on the track. This is going to be fun. So uh, we're just going to let it be. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So one of, the, one of the other things that is probably worth sharing is we built the dashboard last week. Right. To demonstrate, you know, some of the telemetry that we're collecting. So uh, I'm going to share that with everyone now. I'm going to try and walk with the car just in case it doesn't behave well. So. Uh, and that's a pun intended because uh, you know, we're, uh, folks, uh, for, uh, what we're following is a behavioral cloning method here, uh, right? So uh, the car learns to drive just like Justin's uh, driven uh, and we're, we're trying to mimic that. And we'll, we'll, we'll get more details on that. So let's... so let's see if we can get the wide angle shot of the room so uh, we can see the whole track and then we'll get started. 
All right, I think we should be good to go. Okay, so All right. what we have now, it's different than what we did last time, is this is a two lane. Or, or, or two line track, an inside and outside. Last yeah. time we just did a single lane yeah. following. Right. Um, so this, the difficulty is a little bit higher, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so if you want to step on the other side, we'll, or, or actually you need to control the car. So. I'm just going to get it started. Um, this is somewhat what we did in episode two of right. changing it to the local angle right. and selecting the pilot that we trained. And I think uh, maybe you can post the link of the odometer yep. up there. Um, just so that people get, you know, like the RPM, like what uh, Justin actually talked about. All right, so let's get this kicked off. All right. And we'll see what we have. So we actually spent some time uh, last night actually uh, trying collecting the data. And um, Justin, like, do you drive for like five minutes? Uh, I drove for yeah, it's uh, on about, line, about so five minutes. Let's see if it can make the turn. Oh, it does make the turn. Oh, but it's, it's, it's overshoots. Let's see if we can correct that. It's, it's gone way, way <laughs> wide. Come on, bring it back. There we go. Come on. All right, we'll give it a little help. <laughs> All right, that, that, was a, that was a first failed attempt, but... Um, <laughs> All right. Not um, having you luck today. Reset. We will reset and try again. All right. Go for it. All right. All right. That, that didn't work. This <laughs> model is not behaving today. <laughs> so, guys, like, uh, I mean, this is common, right? So, because uh, the lighting was probably different yesterday, uh, there are other factors that may influence. Uh, what we really want to do is collect a lot of training data, different times, uh, and making sure, uh, uh, you know, we train on all of that. So, you want a generalized model and not necessarily... Uh, something that um, you know too just specific, too specific to a track. We're overfitting, right? Correct. So you want it to be working. Um, I'm gonna try it one more time because that right. was rather disappointing. Let's see. It's a demo, so what do you expect? It doesn't always work the way you want, but <laughs> let's see. If you um, can... The demo gods me. All right. I also it did, make, the it, did, it did make the turn, so maybe it was that and. Uh, you want to get that other car? I did lower the speed. Okay. Uh, so what I have it set now is a constant 25% throttle. Uh -huh. So it's it's always going to apply that throttle. Yeah. Uh, so and it's just looking at the angles. And you can see it's clearly missing that turn. I mean, uh, that's probably because of me. Uh, <laughs> uh, it could be, right? Like, you know, you want to add obstacles. You want to have things uh, when you train that it learns. So I'm going to try and sidestep and see if uh, that's gonna help out. It, it doesn't have the problem with that. Uh, nope. It's that corner. Let's see if it's me. Let's help it out with... Uh... Okay. That's good. It, it is actually, it is actually, uh, you know, racing now. I mean, not quite oh, racing, racing, but... but uh, like, it's donkey. Yeah. It's like... Um, so, uh, Justin, you want to put the odometer? I don't know if uh, folks can see that. Uh, yeah, I, I wonder what the speed on. I wonder what the speed on it is. Uh, uh, it's one right now. Two miles. It, it's it's going one mile an hour. So that's. Oh wow. Wouldn't call it a race. I'm gonna set it to thirty five percent. Depends on. Depends on who it's racing, right? Like. Let's it, see uh, if it uh, works any better. If it's racing against ants, uh, perhaps. <laughs> now. Uh-oh, uh -oh. there you go. Collisions do happen, guys, so make sure you're in a safe environment uh, when you try this. Um, so maybe we can dive a little into, um, you know, how uh, and how this actually works, right? Um, so let me pull up my screen. Um, so if people want to follow along, um, it's actually... Uh, I, on my GitHub, um, I have, so we can search to, I'm going to increase my font. Um, hopefully everybody can see this, right? Um, let me know guys if uh, my, my screen is uh, visible uh, and the font size is okay. All right. Um, cool. So, uh, as, as I, 
as I, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're doing behavioral cloning, right? So we have a lot of data. Uh, so the data from Justin's garage uh, uh, that, that, that I've uh, collected and put it on S3. So um, I've created a couple of like helper um, uh, record IO files. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's essentially two binary iterator files uh, to make things easy. But also the, the training data is uh, available uh, I, uh, just if people want to go through images. So, so now the training data, this is an image with the corresponding throttle and angle, right? Correct. That, that's all that we're capturing so correct. far. So the images look like this. So just uh, So the image name looks something like this. Okay. Right? So there's a frame ID. There's a frame ID. Uh, this is the um, uh, so this is the angle mm -hmm. right here, and uh, uh, this is the throttle. So the throttle is at twenty five percent, and right. the angle is twelve percent. So maybe like indicating a slight right turn or something. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, I mean, we uh, um, there's a JSON file now that's corresponding that actually stores all this information because additionally. You know, you don't want a long file name and, you know, you want a more elegant way. Because so that's going to limit the amount of data that you it, can put in there. Exactly, exactly. So, so we have, uh, you know, the JSON file which records all of this. Now, the next, uh, uh, next is we'll actually uh, dive into, uh, you, you know, uh, loading these files. So what we've done is uh, run, a, uh, run a script to convert uh, uh, like into a record iterator file, it's a binary file, compacts all the images. It's got the labels uh, for these images as well. So it's got the throttle values and the angle. Mm -hmm. um, actually, in this case, sorry, just the angle just because the angle. We, we are, uh, we're not using the throttle to train our model. Um, but before that, I would love to kind of like uh, give a five minute primer on convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks uh, have been very successful in the field of images. Um, so computer vision-based algorithms are, 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 are the, most of the state-of-the-art models, mm -hmm. if not all, are convolutional neural network based. Uh, so we'll go a little bit into fundamentals, so the word convolution. So convolution is essentially, uh, so it is the overlap between two functions. So if we take the function f of x as uh, our function to learn or the base, uh, and g of x is our convolutional uh, another function. So the overlap between those functions mm -hmm. is, is, is the convolution. So you can see here um, uh, the blue line as we convolve uh, through the space uh, and you know we, we are actually taking the overlap between these two functions as you can see right like mm -hmm. when you convolve uh, it, it, at each step uh, we get the product and that is actually uh, the output of the convolution. Now it can be of different shapes, right? Uh, as you can see, um, we kind of get a triangle um, because you know it's a complete overlap. So at this point here, uh, there's there's nothing. Here there's an overlap. It goes up, mm -hmm. and then it, it actually gets down, right? So so that's that's what. But what does that mean in case of images? What's convolution, right? Um, so if we dive, uh, uh, we look a little more. Um, convolutions essentially think of it as a matrix. Um, so we have our images are 2D, right? mm -hmm. We're in a 2D representation. I mean, I'm just taking a grayscale image for simplicity. Uh, uh, it can be multidimensional. Uh, but uh, we define filters. So each filter can actually uh, be something specific. It can be an identity filter, which means nothing is changed. Uh, uh, it can be an edge detector, so we can look at, uh, so you can see here. This is an edge detector, and depending upon the values, you can have an edge that is detected, which is oriented this way, or towards the left, towards the right, horizontal, whatever it is. So we can define these uh, filters, and some of these filters are well known. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you might have used softwares, uh, um, you know, where you know there mean filters, and you just apply them. Is there any? Suggestion as which one you apply first. It seems like detecting edge edges is pretty important. Uh, good question. Uh, I mean, what we typically want is not necessarily us specify things, but the model to learn which are the important ones. Okay. Uh, you can always use if you are know the problem really well. Maybe you define and say, "Hey, I know these filters work. I absolutely want them." 
So you can you can do certainly do that. Um, but um, you know, as I said, like you want it to be generated, you want it to be learned. Um, now um, the it's not just edges, and, and the whole point is uh, the human visual system. Uh, we actually, um, it, there have been a lot of studies and uh, this is how we think the vision works is actually by detecting the edges in the texture of people and that's how our visual system works. So this sort of tries to mimic that. Uh, but also what we're looking at is exploiting local information of the pixels. Mm -hmm. So when things appear very close to each other, the locality of that is important. So they collectively mean something. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what a convolution actually brings out, if you think about it. Because let's say, you know, the image is you know, large, we are using a three by three matrix. So, and here's an example as we convolve. So uh, let's say this is our convolution matrix, right? Like the, uh, the gray one. Let's say this is our image and we overlap. So we will take that, matrix and we will slide it on the image. So now these these values here, can you explain what they are? Because some people might be new to sure. matrix uh, multiplication. Yeah, so the value is here. Um, so this is just an image, right? Okay. So this so is the image pixel value. Like pixel value. Pixel value. And in this case, what we've done is we've padded. Okay. Uh, padded with zero so that we, because remember, like as we convolve, uh, you might lose the shape of the image, mm -hmm. right? So you might not get uh, uh, depending upon your kernel or the filter size, you might not end up with the exact same image. And the padding is really important, right? I mean, because if you don't have a consistent size, sure. it's not going to work. Correct, right? correct. Uh, in, in some cases, you might don't, you might not care, but uh, some cases you do. So this is an example with padding. And what you do is uh, you slide that window, and it's just a matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. So uh, zero, 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 this into uh, this into the the matrix that we have. It, it looks like we have a fan of matrix multiplication here. Rick James Couch uh, <laughs> from Twitch is saying, I love matrix math. So you're in the hey, right place. Exactly. I mean, we wouldn't be here without matrix <laughs> multiplication. <laughs> um, so uh, so this is this is what it, uh, the, the, the product. But let me actually show you what the result of that is on okay. an image. I think that will help us. Um, so let me play a video. So you can see it, right? Uh, it went, and if you look at the edge, right? So you look at the edge; it is oriented. Uh, it's tilted a little to the left, and it's it's captured all of those edges um, mm -hmm. on uh, on the feature map there. So how do you determine what size of the box should be? How do you optimize that? Um, the filter size. The filter uh, size. So you want it to be small because you're thinking of local information depending upon you know how large the image is. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, uh, what I've seen people do is anywhere between a three by three and a seven by seven. Usually, that's that's how large it gets, um, uh, and um, that, that's that's kind of what I've seen in practice. So if you don't size that right, are you going to miss edges or what? what uh, it's yeah, um, it, it's it, you know you, you might miss because uh, you you you're taking overlapping windows, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if uh, so, it's a sliding window, correct? Right. Okay. So you're trying to capture continuous behavior of the image, uh, and uh, it's it's honestly it's iterative. Uh, so if a certain kind of size doesn't work, so you kind of look at uh, you know a filter outputs and uh, and see if things are not aligned, things are mm -hmm. so all, all of that. Okay. So so. So now, uh, here's another example, the edge, you can see it does the same thing. So, um, all right, now what, what we do is we also apply this concept called as pooling. Um, so typically, uh, once we've convolved, we get the product matrix uh, and we have a number of filters. So let's say we have like five filters. So what happens is your 2D image and each filter has an output. So if our output, like if our image is say 10 by 10 and we have a one by one filter, uh, our output, um, if we use 10 of those or five of those, what happens is we get five products, right? So we get five images mm -hmm. of those filters. Uh, and then what we do is sometimes uh, uh, we don't need all that information uh, from an image uh, because it's computationally expensive. For example, if we were trying to detect cats, 
Now, let's say this bigger image, can you can you think it's a can you identify it's a cat? Probably, right? Mm -hmm. Like you surprise it. Or if you think about a passport photo of a cat. I mean, even then we can tell it's a cat. So it, it's not necessarily that we have we need to have the, the super high resolution uh, to do some of these tasks. If you're doing satellite imaging or uh, you know lung um, or X-ray segmentation and re in those cases we need high resolution images. But in the, because in we're looking for something really specific. Exactly. But in 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 a picture of a cat, the edges of a cat's right. face are right. typically we're, we're, we're broad. We we're, we're uh, you know we're broadly uh, kind of um, uh, speaking or it's a broad thing that we're looking at, um, not necessarily one tiny thing in mm -hmm. the entire image. So what we do is again we can define a pool size in this case two by two. What that means is we'll take the largest uh, or we can take average or max in case of max pooling. We'll take the largest value like uh, largest value here mm -hmm. as our output. So you can see. Two, four, seven, eight. It's going to be eight, and so on. Okay. So reduced the image, but we've still uh, sort of managed to keep the spatial. Uh, um, we've, we've managed to keep the image. Um, so we're we're basically just keeping the most significant portion, right? Right, right. Here's a question. You know, we used max. What if we use average? Do you have, do you have thoughts? And what do you think will happen? It's me. <laughs> um, no, average, I mean, could be used for different use cases, but uh, remember, if we take the average of all, it kind of smudges, right? So we might okay. end up with a blurred image. Really? Okay. Yeah. So it's not going to look for the most uh, prominent feature. It might just smooth it out, average right. it out, and right. it may not be enough to... Right. I mean, in certain cases, it might not be helpful because uh, if a lot of, uh, uh, like, if we're doing a lot of feature detection, uh, like identifying cats and dogs mm -hmm. and other objects. Uh, object detection is a lot with to do with edges. So if you're blurred out the edges, then you might not <laughs> find but it. I guess the concern I have with just the idea of max is what if there's an outlier, like a really large value that maybe doesn't belong there? Is uh, you you might I mean that's a that's a representative of the data, right? So uh, you might want to clean the data. Okay. Um, you you might uh, so you might want to have it there. You might not want to have it there. So. If that is actually representative of something you want to capture, then you might want to think differently. But in a, in, an, uh, in a usual case, I would say that's sort of like bad data. I mean, let's say somebody put a finger while they okay. take a picture, uh, and now you know that, that, that could be an outlier, right? Um, or in our case with the car, maybe it's the throttle is way too high or the steering angle is yeah. too sharp for anything that would belong here. Cool. You may want to pull yeah. back, okay? Yeah. Do we have questions on Twitch, perhaps? Like, let, let us know. Like, if you're following along, or uh, we can uh, dive deeper on uh, some of the concepts here before I start uh, um, coding on this. It looks like there's no uh, questions right now. Cool. All right. So uh, I pasted the link so you can go check out like the code. I'm just gonna do a quick overview of the code here. Um, I, I've got a live uh, Twitch coding session, which is recorded. If you go to twitch.tv.aws, same channel essentially. Uh, in the video section, you can look at the CNN. Uh, this is a CNN video, um, and you can go through the basics. Um, so what we've done, what I've done here is to just defined uh, an iterator method, which loads uh, uh, image uh, the image record iterator. So which is the rec files and the uh, train.rec and val.rec. Actually, I just uh, thought of this. It's uh, funny, I should change the name because it, it reads train rec. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, for what my model just did, I think that was, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess. might be fitting. <laughs> so, um, well, so once we've defined the iterators, uh, uh, we can, you know, depending upon the batch sizes, I'll, I'll pick 16 as our batch size. And our model that actually pretty much ran um, is as big, like it actually fits on half a screen, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so guys, like it's super easy to declare a convolution. So you do mx.sim.convolution. You specify the number of filters. You specify the kernel size, right? So number of filters, so that means that we have 24 filters, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, stripe, uh, we have a kernel size of five by five, so that's our filter size. So we'll 
on our 120 by 160 image, we will have a five by five cone. So that's box. the sliding. Correct. Okay. And we'll have 24 of those. We have two, two questions, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, so is there a way to decrease the response time for corrective steering? Is there... Um, so I think that's uh, how fast do you want it to react to what uh, it's seeing. Yeah, so I, I think you might want to delay uh, the inference, right? So for example, one of the things could be look ahead prediction, right? So you, you kind of have, um, you're looking, you're skipping the the frame now, the first frame is you're taking 30th frame. Mm -hmm. So things like that. So so depending upon where you want to predict and move, that could actually delay uh, your reaction time. Okay. We've got another question here from Keji. How would we incorporate this into our training our cars? Uh, what? I think uh, the model. Oh, oh this, uh, so yes. Uh, so the donkey uh, build today has a Keras model uh, and which is similar to this. I, I've just dissected that aspect so that we can just focus on the model. Okay. Right. So the training is already done today. Uh, but if you want to kick it up a notch, incorporate more sensors, more data or improve, I think it's important that you understand the inner workings of the model. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll integrate. So as I said, like uh, our goal is to have, uh, you know, um, uh, different frameworks, uh, you know, if you want to choose Keras, if you want to choose TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, we want to make sure we have all that uh, uh, that is available for you to train your model. Uh, just like, um, you know, AWS, we're an open platform. Uh, we have like our deep learning AMI, mm -hmm. which we use to train, have all these uh, fantastic frameworks available uh, for, um, so we want you as a user to, uh, you know, pick whichever uh, thing. Uh, MX that's um, uh, a good uh, for a choice uh, uh, framework because it's it's easy to code, easy to understand. It can scale pretty well. So when we have a lot of training data, you want things to go. Um, uh, if you're doing parallel training, right? Like not a per, uh, like when we have massive scale, we want something that can scale across GPUs mm -hmm. to get that uh, performance boost because faster training, you know, means you know faster deployment of models. You can train many of them find out which is the best model, simulations. Just that. allows you to iterate much faster. Right? Absolutely. One Absolutely. other question here from uh, Babu. Do you have CNN code sample for TensorFlow? Um, I, uh, I, I probably do. I can try and post that on uh, the, okay. uh, uh, the GitHub link. Um, so, cool. cool. So, okay. So coming back, uh, so there are essentially three parts to this. One is convolution. The other one's activation and pooling. So we, we talked about the convolution, we talked about the pooling, but activation. Um, so people are familiar with deep learning. Uh, we we're, we're try, we need a we need we work often in a nonlinear space. Uh, the, so so essentially we we, we need to have, we, we need more complex um, uh, uh, we, we end up with more complex functions that we want to learn, and that's enabled by uh, adding a non-linear uh, function or an activation function that converts things into a more continuous space. Um, now, uh, which is why we apply this, um, um, uh, this activation function. Uh, a good example of that um, as developers, uh, I can tell is, think of the, uh, think of the, the R function mm -hmm. in um, uh, you know, logic um, in logic, right? So if you think about R, it's like you know zero one. If there's a one, then it's it's there. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you think about the truth table there, uh, you can just draw a line and linearly separate them. Okay. Right. So you can just uh, have a line. Uh, but if you think about uh, the XR function, an XR function is when uh, you know it's exclusive, uh, right? Only when both are uh, uh, not the same, that's when you have the bit high. Okay. Um, so what that is, you can't have a linear separation because um, I, I'm going to pull up, uh, I'm going to try and uh, um, oh, let's see, maybe we can there you go. I think that's a helpful one. 
Uh, so you can see here, all the three points are here, so you can draw a line. Now, uh, if you have it this way, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the XR function. We can't really separate that, right? Like there's no line that you can draw uh, to separate those lines. So you need a nonlinear, uh, 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 it needs to be nonlinearly separable. So you kind of like have this curly wiggly line. And that's sort of what's intuitively happening uh, here because we're learning a more complex thing. So we need to introduce a nonlinear function uh, so that we project this onto a continuous space and uh, we can learn those crazy shapes. Okay. Right? Like, I'll just stop there. I'll not go too much into the math. <laughs> and this, what are the shapes? Uh, anything. Well, like, anything, okay. Uh, like, those are very weird shapes. Uh, it depends on uh, the function that you're trying to learn. So in does the shapes have anything to do with like the way that the track is laid out or is it just no, pure no, mathematics? No, this is pure mathematics. Okay. We're thinking about uh, these uh, function curves, right? So for example, as we saw here, um, so we're trying to learn essentially these functions. So a convolution. Mm -hmm. So if we want to like learn, this is our, th this is our optimal function. That, that, that's how the data is spread okay. out. So we're trying to learn that. But the, the, the problem is this is a very high dimensional space. So it's never like this curve. So it's actually like, it's sort of like a Martian, uh, you know, landscape. That, that's, that's like, that's the good visualization of the function you want to learn. Now, in order to do that, you, you can't learn with linear lines. You need all these uh, curves. Right. It's, uh, it's not going to look as clean as that, right? No. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Now, uh, a little bit into this, and I promise we're going to race in about five minutes, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Um, so we come up, well, we, uh, we had one layer of convolution, then we had another layer of convolution, this time with more filters. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we add a, a, a fully... We dropped the bias here, right? It's Seems like there's oh, no bias true. Oh, front, no, but... no, no, don't worry about the okay. syntax. Uh, um, I, I just, um, for readability, I cut it off. Got it. Uh, okay. By, by default, uh, it is. <laughs> so um, we have a fully connected layer. Um, and what that means is we've learned all these features. Now we need to connect all those individual neurons. Uh, and I have an animation for that. So here. So if you think of all of these pixels, we need to bring all of that together home. Uh, so that's why we connect each of these components together so that we, we combine all that learnings, right? So that's the intuition behind a fully connected uh, layer. And then uh, we're taking from a really high dimensional space to a fairly uh, smaller dimensional space. So our, our hidden node is 32. Mm -hmm. um, and then we add another Usually you can add multiple fully connected layers. Typical networks have uh, like one or two um, and more complex and more, uh, you know, they can have more. But the idea is you're going from a really highly dimensional space. So you, you don't want, because remember our output layer here is just one. Why is it one? That, that's the, the answer, answer, right? That's the angle, right? So we're just predicting the angle. So this is a regression uh, output that we're looking at. But we could have a lot, we could have a really large, um, you know, highly dimensional space and we're going to just one, right? So you want to make sure that learning is a little, you know, uh, step function rather than mm -hmm. one large dip. We don't want it to fall off of a cliff. We want it to <laughs> gradually. So, play. yeah, so incorporate the learnings and so on. That's the logic behind. And that's really searching for the the minimum, right? Right. So here's a visualization of the graph. As I said, I won't, uh, so 120 by 160, there were five by five, uh, five by five kernel, 24 of them. So we get 24 outputs mm -hmm. and it's 58 by 78. Why we didn't, you know, we didn't pad and we used a five by five, which is a large filter. So we got a smaller size. And when we um, pull, as you can see, it's almost reduced into half mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, now what, what I'm going to do is, um, so here's a cool thing, so I can, um, I, I declare the module and I call a fit function. So what we have is a train iterator. Um, so uh, I, the fit function takes a training data, we give it uh, 
the training iterator. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the validation iterator. We always keep a set that uh, the training hasn't seen so that we can always see how well the model generalizes, right? So eval metric is uh, MAE or mean absolute error. Uh, the idea being we're just looking at what's the difference between the angle prediction. Okay. So, so that's, that's our metric to see how close we are to what we have learned. Um, optimizer, uh, so uh, we'll use Adam, which is a pretty common one. Uh, um, so optimization is the, in the learning process, we need to find uh, the best uh, gradient. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it quick 30 seconds. So deep learning, we have two phases, forward pass and backward pass. A forward pass is when we do, remember all that convolution multiplications, all that happened. But now, when we get the output and we predict the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, it, it's probably not correct because, uh, you know, it was just initialization without the actual weights. So what happens is we need to calculate the delta, how far we are off, mm -hmm. and correct these weights that we have in our network. So the whole process of deep learning is essentially learning those weights on all those edges uh, in the network. And, and now, uh, by uh, one of the process uh, to do that is called stochastic gradient descent, which is a very common one. Uh, essentially, you're trying to find that gradient. Again, I, I won't go too deep here. Uh, all the deep learning frameworks come pre, uh, uh, you know, loaded with all these great tools. Adam is one of the most advanced ones. Mm -hmm. You can just literally plug this in uh, and get that. Now, learning rate is uh, when we're trying to find that delta gradient, right? So it's kind of you're, imagine you're on the ski slope and you're trying to find, uh, you want to get at the bottom of the hill, right? Now, what you do is you, you kind of orient yourself in the, in the direction of the steepest uh, slope and you go fast. And the steps you take, that's the learning rate. Okay. So if you're too fast, you could actually, you know, you, you reach there really fast. But the problem is uh, if the valley is too narrow, you overshoot that because you're taking you know, little steps. So you may have went a path that doesn't actually Correct. lead you to the bottom. Exactly. You, you went too fast. You, you're, you end up on another hill. Another. So the learning rate is that, uh, that, that that's important. The number of epochs is the number of epochs we want to run. That is how many times the network sees the training data entirely. All right. Sorry about that. We have a question here. Where can I find the deep learning framework? Um, as in, uh, as a, uh, like any specific deep learning framework? Uh, I guess the one that we're, we're talking about here. So uh, you mean the code? Well, they're built into the deep learning army, right? Correct. So, so the, the code, correct. Yeah. So the code itself, uh, uh, rather, um, the, the environment is provided by AWS. Uh, we have deep learning AMI, which is uh, all the popular frameworks like MXNet, uh, TensorFlow, Keras, um, uh, yeah, cafe, all of that is available. This particular code, it's on the GitHub link. Uh, 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 can we share this? Uh, uh, Justin, if you can share uh, this link, uh, it's uh, GitHub's new Maya Robocard 2017. Um, so that's where you can take this code and play around. Now, I'm going to kick off the training and explain a little bit what happened. So we can see here. Uh, the mean absolute error starts at 56.56 uh, and we see it uh, sort of decrease to 0.16 and so on. But, you know, it kind of stays just around there. Yeah, it's not getting yeah. really any yeah. better. Yeah, so, and it's kind of like a little oscillating. So, you know what, like, this is kind of an intuition where our learning rate was too fast. We just learned too fast. So, I'm going to slow it down and see what happens. So it starts at 0.7, well, you know, uh, it's still kind of sort of oscillating, oscillating. So that's the intuition, right? Like we might be overshooting. So let's slow it down further and see uh, what's happening. And this is where it really helps to use a deep learning army with you know, a powerful machine. Yep. So that you're able to just do this and, on a much faster basis. Yeah, and, and, and look at this, right? So we actually have it 
uh, we have it actually reduced quite a bit. Uh, quite a bit. So so that's that sort of becomes our optimal. Um, that sort of becomes our optimal learning rate for now. So um, I'll just let it train and see if people have questions. So we've got a question here um, from W Roscoe Donkey Car. I imagine that's Will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he says, it would be also great to see how to splice models together in MXNet. For example, I'm thinking about training the convolutional layers on all the data and then randomizing the bottom layers and training on the data from the racetrack I'm currently on. Yeah, so that'll be advanced. Uh, uh, we can, um, uh, well, we can maybe, uh, uh, you can provide what, the data set and uh, uh, we can incorporate that and actually share on GitHub as well. Um, that's totally doable. Um, and what Will's talking about is more of a fine tuning approach, which is uh, all convolutional networks uh, sort of learn similar features uh, regardless of what we're doing in the sense that because the object detection or uh, identification is usually because of edges, edge orientations, features, all of that uh, mm -hmm. is incorporated. So, so maybe we can, the intuition there uh, perhaps is we can actually learn all of these, uh, um, you know, generic, which is generic across all tracks, but we only, uh, you know, train uh, on, um, for a specific track, we could just fine tune uh, using just that data mm -hmm. and might work well uh, because we, we might need a lot less data uh, and have a generalized model. So okay. it, it's worth a shot and uh, I can share uh, code uh, on that specifically. Cool. So, so we've... It looks like we slowed our skier down quite a bit. Correct. So at this point, maybe they're walking down the hill, but they yep. got a much more effective correct. minimum, right? Correct. Yes. Um, so I'll stop there and, uh, you know, while we can look at, uh, inspect uh, more on the images, uh, maybe it's actually time to uh, do a race, perhaps. Yeah, let's, we can certainly race. We'll see if we can get another car on the track. Yes. Uh, and maybe uh, the models will behave a little bit better. And we'll we see. Uh, again, um, let's pray to the demo gods. <laughs> You take that car out. We've got a few here. I don't know if they're all gonna run, but we can see. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think the car, third car does run, or let's see. This one seems off, maybe. So we'll leave him off for now. All right. Actually, while uh, while we set up, maybe I'll uh, I'll actually continue uh, with this. I think we have uh, we're trying to wait on um, the odometers coming up. So we got the odometer. Uh, let's see if we can get the second car up and running. So let, let's 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 work on um, uh, let's work on the setting uh, um, and uh, while we do that. All right, guys. Uh, so it's super easy. So once we have actually trained the model, uh, uh, here we can see you can just do mod dot save checkpoint um, and uh, uh, give it the prefix and the epoch, and then it saves the model. And loading is pretty simple as well. You can do just do uh, load dot checkpoint. So, so the test. Uh, so what what we really want to look here, guys, is um, is the validation accuracy, right? So, so training accuracy is on the training data set and validation is on the set that is never seen, right? So you want the validation accuracy to be really low. Mm -hmm. that, that, that actually means that your network is, uh, you know, generalized. Okay. So uh, is everything set up, Justin, uh, to, uh, to race? Looks like we got maybe a third racer Online here. Okay. Let's uh, let's maybe uh, yeah we can switch to the track cam and uh, um, wh wh why don't we verify that all the cars are okay to go? All right. All right. That works. 
How about car number two? No oh, works. Wait, 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 wait. I want a head start. <laughs> no cheating. No cheating, Justin. Um. Okay. So we got three cars here. I'm uh, I'm gonna call uh, uh, the. Okay, on your mark. Get set. Go! Uh, you look good at that stuff. <laughs> I don't want your one car, that seems to. That's so good. Look at that. Uh oh. Alright, the orange car finally made that turn. Uh, and it blew that one. It's catching up. I, I think you should reduce the throttle, perhaps. That's what's... Uh... Oh, it did overtake! <laughs> if I reduce the throttle, it's not really racing then, but yeah. So, that's the other thing. Right now, it's a constant throttle. Right. Right. And if right. you're racing a car, right. you're not going to go around a corner the same right. way as a straightaway. So, right. there's a, a whole lot of room for, uh, you know, improvement on how you design a car to actually race versus just go around by itself. Right. <laughs> this is uh, this is a, this can be a little chaotic, but it's a lot of fun um, when I actually get uh, get along working. So, I mean, this is kind of this is kind of what you can expect, I would say. Uh, so, uh, at, at the car at the robot car rally, right? So we have more cars, uh, we have more people. Um, we'll, we'll have more time to actually train and get it really working. So, seems like your car is doing pretty well, Justin. Um, uh, and this was just about five minutes of training on this track this morning. Right. So, that car seems to be a little off. <laughs> uh, we should have it off the track. Uh, and then, uh, we got car number two. So, I think we should have the car like wait a little bit. I don't know. If people have ideas, please throw. Maybe we can uh, throw some obstacles at them. Uh, <laughs> we do have one obstacle we can introduce here. So but I'm gonna try and uh, induce a chase. <laughs> I think it should be not on the uh, the turn. I would We've say. We've got a, a tanker truck. We can try to throw in here. All right. Uh, and we'll just pull that slow moving traffic. I don't, it doesn't belong on a racetrack, but it's there. Yeah. I. Uh oh. We got a little help. What happened? And uh, it avoids! It did avoid the car, so. Well done. That one's got a. A little bit of speed to it now. That donkey must have learned. All right. I, I forgot to ask him, uh, who the favorites are. Maybe we should. Uh, now that people have a demo, maybe we should have a final race at the end, and people can bet on which <laughs> car. Um, all right. We'll call it the orange team versus. Uh, not ours. <laughs> How about that? That's a deep learning fun again. Uh, I don't know if you've um, uh, all these jokes about like the hot dog or not hot dog. Right. The, uh, the whole model where you're trying to detect uh, presence and absence, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll call it the orange and not orange uh, uh, team. Orange, not orange. <laughs> uh, so we have a question from uh, W. Roscoe Donkey Car again. Wants to know. How the training data was collected? Always driving the, down the same track, or was it varied? So I actually did about seven or eight laps. I went all the way around, uh, so it saw every curve. We've got some hard right angles, but also right. one left turn. Right. Um, so it's important that it sees, you know, how to turn right, how to turn yeah. left. Um, so I, I did about six or seven laps, um, and you know, I, I think I could have probably done more. Although now it's working better than it did when I first put it down. <laughs> Perhaps it likes the spirit of competition. Uh, and it just comes to uh, me, I guess, uh, it wants to be on camera. <laughs> uh, we we want to stop this and um, 
let's let's stop the race and like let's continue with um so um so here, here what I've done is uh, uh to do the prediction once the mo uh once we've loaded the model we can just uh, run the forward dot uh, mod dot forward, just a forward function, mm -hmm. because we're not calculating or correcting based on uh, the issues there, right? So, so we just uh, feed in the image as uh, MXNet ND array, mm -hmm. and then we get the outputs, uh, and we can basically calculate what the expected. Um, I think one of the I think your uh, yeah, car is stuck. There you go. So uh, we get the expected angle, uh, and then uh, the angle that um, you know um, we predicted, and we can see how far off they are. So in this case, you can see the diff is uh, 0 0.19, 0 0.09, which is sort of um, it's sort of in the acceptable range, and uh, and the real it, it's sort of it's a it's a little difficult here because we. It's hard to calibrate. Uh, it's not a. Uh, it's not quite a, one of those uh, examples where it's super intuitive, but you're looking for a small number essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, what's really helpful is uh, trying to get like a simulator going. So mm. I, what, what I, you know, maybe you know it when you actually put it down and you know. Well, I've got a small uh, MAE error on the model, and I think that's like that's sort of the intuition we have right now. Well, what would be awesome, I, I know if you folks are working on a simulator, uh, kind of get that so that you know you need training data and you're not necessarily going this iteration uh, because there's a physical component involved here, right? Like actual... Uh, so this will out. actually allow you to iterate much faster than driving around the track, right? So, Absolutely, that's the goal. You know, the, the vehicle went around, I don't know, maybe 10 times and it did it right, yeah. about half that, Yeah. right? So could we do this tens of hundreds or thousands of times by using a simulator to Correct. see how well this works? Exactly, right? and we could generate more training data and so on. So I, I built this, this simple uh, uh, simulator uh, and it just plots every image. So what's happening is, and I'm gonna reiterate this, at every uh, image, right? So we, we look at the image and we see what is the angle, right? What's the predicted angle? And based on that angle prediction, the car, what did it, it moves, actually do? Yeah, right. exactly. So I'm gonna run this. So I simulate with the little car here, <laughs> the red box and... Um, it went sideways. It, so when uh, last week yeah, you wanted to build the drift car, it looks like yeah. that one just kind of drifted around the corner. Yeah, and which is, this is probably, <laughs> but it came back, right? So this is actually how you drove, Justin. It wasn't well, the self driving. That, <laughs> that is how you drove. So we can, um, so instead of um, uh, using the angle with the file, what we can do is um, we can do the prediction. Um, so I'm going to try and do the prediction and get the angle and then plot. Um, so yeah, time for live coding. So it looked like there was at least a, a few frames there where I potentially oversteered. Uh, oh. That goes back to the right. max, right? So right. maybe having we... the right data. Uh, is super uh, important. So, so the image, so the axis, I think this is the fun with live coding. So I I get the angle. Uh, let's, go, let's go the same one and see what happens. Good work. Uh, so Okay, I have... Uh, there's another question here from Rick James Couch. Can you incorporate steering angle and duration to avoid overcorrection? Um, so that would, that would kind of mean that we need to understand how long are we holding a turn for? First, like a quick turn versus a, um, a slower turn. That, that would be potentially useful to be able to incorporate that to kind of smooth out the corner. This way you're not uh, making an overly harsh turn. All right, I think I have fixed it. Yeah. Uh, sorry guys, uh, this is 
this is the fun of live coding. Uh, it, it's uh, okay. I think I know what's happening. Is original image and become plotted because I have changed the image. So there's a few. Oh, there you go. All right. Because so, so well, no, we've got a few of the questions here. Um, there you go. It's moving now. You this got is it. a okay. predicted. Oh, it actually drove. Uh, sort of drove just like you, Justin. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I, I that's must have missed the turn and I had a way over correct. <laughs> that, that that's, that's the data doesn't lie. Like yeah, <laughs> exactly. So. Uh, I mean, it's the it's good thing is, uh, I mean, that's what we're trying to do is behavioral cloning, right? So, yep. if, uh, so which is why, guys, it's very important to get the right uh, training data. Um, you you want to make sure the training data is clean. But again, not, not super clean because you don't want it to be overfitting. You, uh, some amount of noise is good. Uh, what that number is, I don't know, intuitively, I want to say like 10% maybe is a good enough number uh, to kind of have it off. Uh, so that you're not really generalizing uh, there. I mean, which is fine if that's a well-defined track, but from a race perspective, you know, we're not gonna, you're not gonna be racing on the same track you trained on. We will modify the track. We wanna see how well you can generalize and learn. It has to be able to adapt. Correct, right? correct. Yeah. And, and there's no fun doing it on the same, so we wanna kick it up a notch uh, and do that. Uh, so maybe we can go to questions. Yeah, on... a few of the questions. Uh, what's the difference between each card? Do they run a different algorithm? No, um, the, the algorithm, at least like what we have done is the same algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happens is training data is different. Uh, the behavior or how we have actually uh, moved is different. Uh, but the, the answer is you can and you should change it because cars uh, can be calibrated slightly differently uh, and you, you might want to adjust like your throttle settings uh, and uh, your angle calibrations, all of that. So uh, it's a good idea to have a specific model for your car. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, we've not necessarily done any modifications on each of the cars. But the benefit of using the same platform of this vehicle is uh, the camera's mounted the same correct, way. So correct. we should be able to share so, this. Exactly. So. Uh, what we can do is, uh, uh, you know, share data amongst each other, um, get a lot of training data, so that way we can enhance. Uh, but the underlying algorithm itself remains the same. Mm -hmm. But as I said, uh, if you're, the reason why I, uh, you know, went through this uh, little primer on deep learning was because uh, we can adjust the learning rate, a different optimizer, maybe you can define a custom function, mm -hmm. uh, like a distance function or called the loss function. That way you can actually find that amazing uh, model that's going to tackle all these things. Okay. Got another question from CHR Wong. How long did it take for you to work on the code for the car? Code for, uh, I mean, it was a community effort, right? right. Like the entire, uh, so Will, Adam, and the Donkey community contributed. So Will was on the chat. Maybe he can iterate. From what yeah. I know, like this, is, uh, this has been... This is iterated over the last like eight months. Yeah. Uh, so We've just cloned the GitHub repo for correct. what the community's built. Correct. Um, yeah. And mine is essentially stock. I have not really changed that other than adding right. additional telemetry. And I mean, what I built, uh, if you're particularly talking just about the deep learning part, like, uh, I mean, I got this up and running in maybe an hour, hour and a half. Uh, also, given that I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, deep learning, that was easier for me. Uh, but the idea is, again, I've presented this uh, to you guys um, uh, on a GitHub repo. I'll put the simulator as well. That'd be cool. More cool. I was trying to get a little car, Robocar, mm -hmm. in there. It was too difficult. I just got this working last night. So, <laughs> in, our, in our first series that we did, uh, we had Will and Adam on, and we went through uh, you know, had the build process, the build materials, how to right. build this on your own. And it's a couple hours worth of work, uh, and it's pretty easy to get started. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there more questions? Uh, it looks like we are caught up here. All yeah. right. Comments. I see Adrian. Uh, 
Adrian's actually tuned in. Hey, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, Adrian's uh, saying, to me, it's like training to have a knee-jerk reaction to be scared of the white lines. And that was in response to the overcorrection. <laughs> yeah, well said. <laughs> and also, when I was driving, I didn't realize it would be broadcasted <laughs> like that, so... Uh, yeah, I, I've used that. Uh, I, I found that data set very useful. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's also reflective of what all of us do, right? Like, we have... We'll do this in a backyard. We, you know, yeah, it, it's 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 a true hack, <laughs> right? Right, and, and if the if the data lined up perfectly, it probably wouldn't be as interesting. But Perfect. yeah, uh, but I think the idea with the simulator is it gives you more time to kind of train without necessarily being on the road and doing it. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, I mean, that's sort of what I have with deep learning. If uh, people don't have questions, uh, we can wrap up. Yeah, uh, looks like those are the extent of the questions that we have. Okay, fantastic. So guys, remember uh, the Robocar Rally is in Las Vegas at reInvent, 26th and 27th of November. So join us for the mixer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to talk, we're going to give a little tutorial, we're going to recap on how to build a car, but please do bring your car. Like it'd be fantastic to see what you guys have worked on, new sensors, uh, we'll, we'll also provide more sensors of the hackathon, but we want to see what you've built and showcase uh, that to us. Um, yeah. And um, uh, anything else you want to add? For those who are just tuning in for the first time, uh, we've mentioned this is our fourth uh, right. stream. Yeah. So the first one, kind of, we, we cover uh, the purpose of the project, why we're doing it, how to build it. Yeah. The second one, we went over how you actually train the model. So you know, you lay down your track. Uh, you learn, you, you teach it to drive, you train the model using deep learning AMI. In our third episode, we uh, incorporated the telemetry collection and right. the AWS IoT service uh, and some automation using right. EC2 Systems Manager. Um, so between those three and then today, it's a pretty good uh, body of knowledge for those who just want to get started now. And not just Twitch, we have blog posts. And right? the blog so posts. We have blog posts all for, uh, we have two that are live, uh, we'll have two more uh, explaining all this. The code's available on GitHub. Um, so there's no reason not to build a car, really. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really it's a really fun project. Uh, and we've outlined a lot of the steps so that it's easy right. for you to kind of iterate and you know take it to the next level. Absolutely. So thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you there. Uh, please, please, uh, hashtag Road to Green Win. Keep sending us your photos yep. of your car videos. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to be there. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun, a lot of learning. Uh, we're all gonna, everybody's going to be a, an autonomous driving expert by, Absolutely. That's <laughs> by all. the end of the hackathon. So see you there, guys. Thank you. Thank you.